we are here to talk about art and luxury and collecting. And we are fortunate to have Dominique Levy and Peter Marino here, who are probably two of the most expert opinions on the subject in the world. So this is uh, pretty fortunate for us. And I'd like to start just by jumping into things, um, talking about a bit of news that we have, which is that Dominique announced less than 24 hours ago, I think, that she's opening up a major new space in Hong Kong. And so I'd love to ask you, why Hong Kong? Why now? And does it relate to engaging collectors and engaging audiences in a new way? Engaging collectors and engaging audience is what I think we strive to do. Making a gallery alive, creating emotion, doing exhibition and building events is what the gallery is trying to do. So Hong Kong, why? Because we've seen an extraordinary growth in Asian collector and in Asian interest in post-war and contemporary art. Mm. And, and recently, have you noticed that people are coming into your gallery space in a different way than they were? Are you having a <laughs> tough time? I mean, I think today people are so engaged by many different ways that getting them into the gallery is the most difficult. Mm. At the same time, it's the most exciting. So I see the gallery really as a think tank, as a laboratory where people come, experience art, but experience music, dance, conversation, poetry. And I, you know, I'm a romantic. I think that art can change you, can change the world. And to me, the gallery is very much the heart of this activity. Well, and so, so for people who don't know, Peter, you, um, along with being a quite noted architect, are also an arts patron, not just personally, but through the art that you commission for all of your projects. And thinking about Hong Kong and thinking about these we different- should, We should start with what I commissioned for Hong Kong. We commissioned um, Michal Rovna to do an artwork on the outside. I did a white marble building um, called Prince's Building, and it was a six-story Chanel. And we commissioned Michal Rovna, the Israeli artist, to make a projection on it. I think it's coming up on the screen soon. Mm -hmm. And when you talk to artists, they ask, funnily enough, like business people, well, how many people do you think will see this artwork? Well, the town of Hong Kong said, between nine and 12 million. <laughs> <It was Mike. laughs> she said, okay, I'm in. <laughs> so, yeah. Very visionary of you to choose her. Right? Really? Right? Do, you, do you want to talk about who this artist is for the audience? Michal Rodin is an Israeli artist. Um, She's, uh, she, uh, she gained a great deal of fame by, by representing Israel in the Venice Biennale in 2005. And uh, then she did a fantastic installation at the Louvre and uh, has uh, really influenced outdoor art. You know, she, she, her specialty is projections on outside buildings, which kind of reminds me of Fellini films in Italy when you had movies on the outside of buildings. But her work is very, very cool. And we've done it in the Middle East, and we've done it in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. um, well, so, so when you think about commissioning these works, are you thinking about a regional audience? Are you thinking about what art people in Hong Kong will like versus what art people nope, in? Absolutely not. <laughs> really? You, you think that art and taste is global at this point? I don't know. I just want what I want. And <laughs> well, I agree, I agree and wholeheartedly. so far, it's worked pretty well for me. And um, I, I, I mean, I'm presenting my ideas in collaboration with an artist. And I don't believe, and I, I know you didn't mean that, but it's, you know, when you sort of pander to a local audience, like you've got no chance. You know, you've got to put out there what you think is best. Well, I agree with, with you. I mean, art to me has no nationality, no gender. I don't like talking about a woman artist. African-American artist, I think an artist is an artist. And when we do an exhibition, it's not geared to a public. It's geared to something we find extraordinary, something we find of the highest quality, something we find is relevant now, hmm. but not really here, it's now. And yet, you're dealing with, you're both dealing with a very high echelon of people. And yet, you're going to all of these different places. Do you notice any sort of regional differences in the way that people approach art and collecting specifically? Dominique, do you want to kind of start with that? I mean, I'll answer out of subject by telling you that when I went and uh, go to the streets of Hong Kong, I want to go into any shop because I think the windows, the creativity, Prada there is sexy and exciting. I find Prada in New York so boring. So I think what's happening is 
Um, the public are more excited right now, maybe in Asia. Uh -huh. uh, maybe they've been more blasé here, but we still try to surprise them. Um, and I think in Europe, you have a public that just loves art as an old, old tradition and is always curious to explore. But I don't see a trend in our different publics, no. I don't know if you do. I don't, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I, I don't look at trends. I'm not that clever. I try to create them, that's mm. all. Well, but pivoting exactly to that point, that is exactly the perfect transition because you both in various ways try to create trends. And so I'm curious if you can look at what you've been doing now and look at what you might be doing next year and think about, Dominique, in your case, maybe a period that you're trying to get your collectors interested in and in your case, a project that you feel like is really representative, not necessarily of meeting demand, but of creating it. Look, I think trend, I agree with Peter, is, is a very difficult word, but I try to engage the clients, the collectors, the museum, the public with things that I like. And I'm very, very interested right now in, and I've always been, in everything that starts with the post-war and the vision and the redefinition and relooking at abstraction and not just here in America. I think there's extraordinary artists to still be studied and looked at in Europe, in Asia. And by having now galleries all around the world, it gives us that extraordinary possibility. I'm also interested in sculpture. I think it's still a field where people don't look enough. We look easier uh, at painting than at sculpture and I think Peter is a sculptor, among other things. It's and on the screen, one of the sculptures exactly, I and, just and commissioned. And, and I hope you'll all go see that 66-foot high sculpture in the atrium at Chanel, which just opened a week ago on 57th. And that wow. was a specific, site-specific sculpture that was commissioned. Um, it weighs three tons of glass and uh, took two years to make. I mean, it's, it's but you've always believed in sculptures. I mean, it's Always, always. Um, I was, I was a sculpture major before I transferred to architecture because I needed a job. So. <laughs> Seems like it worked out. <laughs> um, but well, it's, so, it's, so far, is it? it? It's interesting that you're distinguishing between people collecting sculpture and people collecting paintings. Do you find that a lot of people will do one versus the other? No, I find that it's easier to start with painting. It's more obvious. It's less, it, it's less demanding, mm -hmm. uh, and it's easier. But I think that any true collector, like any true institution, like any true art devoted space, one doesn't go without the other. Mm. But I do believe that there's more work in engaging the public with sculpture right now than with painting, yes. Hmm. Um, I, mean, I want to circle back a little bit to this idea of shaping trends because this is something that I think a lot of people here in the audience are also very interested in in their own way. They're also working on this in their own industries. Um, and so I want to kind of ask you, Peter, about this idea of projects that you've done where you feel like you're in whatever way pushing the envelope or trying something new? Two in New York, because so you can all see them. I'll give you an easy reference. Um, I think it was... We did what, in, a, in the ground floor space of sequence building, if you have a chance, you should all go over and have a drink at a place that I did called Lobster Club, which we think we set a new paradigm for doing restaurants. Why, what is it? It's, it, it's a, you know, <laughs> by the way, it's being copied, I already heard, by 30 people. It's one-third bar, one-third lounge, which is different, and one-third restaurant. In, in this new trend of people just want to go after work for an hour or two, and you don't necessarily want to tank out on four martinis, but you'd like a drink and a nice seat, and you want maybe a light hors d'oeuvre. So we have these three levels of serving. And this is a big trend. Um, I had never... Uh, worked on restaurants before. I don't really think they're great architectural spaces, but afterwards we had the six leading chefs of the world come to us. Unfortunately, also Robuchon, we were doing one for him in Paris and he passed away. But all of a sudden they said, wow, you've got the trend at the moment. I didn't really sort of know it, but it is the trend in restaurants. The second thing is we did the Getty down on 24th Street and, we have that up and uh, 10th Avenue. And this is a condominium and it was great because um, in areas that are being quickly developed, like it's happening in Long Island City now, what happens is in areas of Brooklyn, you have lower real estate, you have a demand, and who goes in are fairly low-end developers who build really cheap, unpleasant housing. And that's what happened in Chelsea 
And I had said no to three developers before I don't do that kind of work. And then finally we got when I said, you know, I'm only interested if you do a good building and a serious piece of architecture and blah, blah, blah. So we found someone who agreed to that and we built the Getty. Here's a trend. Here's a condominium for commercial development where no two apartments are the same. Twelve apartments, each one is unique. I don't think you're the same as she, and I don't think she's the same as he. So I don't really believe this one shoe size fits all. And I made it a building with 12 different apartments, and it has, there's no wood to touch, but so far it's been very, very successful. And for me, it's not that I'm a control freak, but I have yes, to do... Yes, you are. <laughs> I have to do the outside, the inside, the furniture, the signage, and everything. So... Um, we designed the Lehman Mopin Gallery, which is the ground three floors. Then up two floors coming next year, in the middle of the next year, you'll see the, um, the Hill Family Art Foundation. The wonderful use of space, I'm designing that. <coughs> and we have uh, one chap from Texas who bought the top three floors. We're combining them into a triplex. So this kind of individuality, I really hope, returns to combat. Uh, may I say the development that I see on the west side, 44 floors, and I looked at it, and I said, well, show me the different apartments, and they give you one floor plan, you know, and I went, oh, 44 floors, oh, okay, okay, that's, um, it's great, like, well, so uh, I hope my trend will come back a little bit, that's all. You know, this, this raises a really interesting point that I am curious how you deal with, which is, there's one thing to buy a work of art, it's another thing to actually hang the work of art. And I'm curious how much you are beginning to think about. That's a good question. Yeah, how um, to. She's great at hanging. I've seen her with a, ha a hammer. I mean, it, it, it's. <laughs> oh, great. yeah. It's really? We actually have worked together, and he's seen me with the hammer. But, but uh, actually, one of the places where I see my creativity, you know, I'm a failed artist. I tried, I tried, and everything's in the closet, and I'm just a fail. So, where I see my creativity is actually exactly there hanging an exhibition, hanging a booth at an art fair, working with a collector and working and hanging a collection. It's challenging, but I think that's where the most courage and the greatest collections are, are done. You don't need a big white wall and a picture in the middle. You can hang salon style, you can hang low, you can hang high. You have so many different ways of installing art, and I think that this is something that we never talk much about. I think it's one of your greatest talent, too. I've seen you hanging your own collection and, and working with clients in their collection. It brings a collection alive. And strangely, what I always say to a client when he wants to sell a piece of art, I said, why don't we change first the wall? And then really? you see, because it has a different story. So hanging art, I don't think it's a difficult uh -huh. part of being a collector. I think museum, foundation, anything any one of you hang on their wall, it's part of living with art. But I think that's a place where you can be quite creative, quite courageous. Really? And so you brought up a foundation. And for people who don't know, uh, Peter announced this summer that he is um, opening uh, a massive new foundation of his own uh, collection in Southampton. Um, and when will it be completed? About two years, the construction will be finished. And it's um, Southampton for a few reasons. I think New York is crowded. There's literally thousands of galleries and foundations in New York in the east end of Long Island, which I love very much and kind of grew up at, um, I think could use uh, uh, a really high standard of aesthetic culture. So I'm very excited about it. My fantasy is that when I retire in 20 years, I'll be able to run the foundation. Total fantasy. I won't be able to retire? afford it. But, <laughs> but whatever. Um, that's it. I wanted to say anything about Dominique and I, what we play and in this luxury game, what our clients play. For those of you who remember in college literature, Thomas Mann's Magister Ludi. <laughs> I gotta keep this one. <laughs> Dramatic pause. Mm -hmm. No, but I think so. There's a thing called the bead game. And they take <clears throat> in this artificial society, they have what they call the bead game players. The entire point of the book is you have a, something similar to an abacus, and you, the highest level of philosopher looks at the relationship of beads, one to the other. They're all the same shape, and they're all the same size. And the bead players <laughs> go like this all day long and discuss 
the aesthetic value of what is in front of them. Dominique, I know, does it with paintings. I've see, seen her hang them, and I do it with my architecture mm. and interiors. It's, it's a, it's, it is a luxury to be a bead game player. You know, thinking about that idea of being able to have the, the, the time and the resources to admire a work and kind of seek out different works that you find particularly interesting or beautiful or challenging in whatever way, um, and, and tying this back to the idea of um, your foundation, Dominique, you deal with a lot of people who are buying a lot of extremely important, extremely expensive artworks. And some of them well, are putting... Extremely beautiful. We, we don't go by important. We don't go by important. I extremely... agree wholeheartedly. <laughs> okay. yeah. I don't like, is that an important work of art? Okay. Oh. A beautiful work of art. Thank you. Is there a difference between people who are buying art for their own just kind of collection to hang on their wall and the people who are buying for their foundations? Is there a way they approach that differently? Look, it all depends what a foundation is. I, I have mixed feeling about foundation. You have foundation that are done for the beautiful idea, the, the romantic, the idealistic idea, and that enhance daily life and cultural life. And I'm sure that that's where Peter is going. You also have foundation that are just bluntly ego trip. And you have foundation where people just sort of celebrate uh, an ego. So to me, when you start doing something that's going to be public, you have an enormous responsibility. And that responsibility is integrity. And that integrity is your taste, your vision, your core belief. And, and as long as you stick to that and you have the generosity then to give it and to share it, then a foundation is very beautiful. And yes, do people buy differently when they have a public mission than when they have a very private, intimate mission? Yes, very different because there's issues of coherence, there's issue of uh, aesthetic coherence, there's issue of a message. There's so many different ideas to take in consideration. Hmm. But I think at heart, a collector is a collector whether the end becomes a foundation or a beautiful gift to an existing museum or a beautiful home that you open sometimes. And I agree with Peter, it's, it's not important. It's meaningful, relevant, beautiful. Those are the words that I like to use for the works of art. So for this conference, um, we had people doing uh, live polling where they were um, being asked um, and where the audience has been asked um, hopefully, uh, a question about what it is that they think about when they're going to buy a work of art. And so in thinking in 2019, if they're going to buy a work of art, what they're actually going to do with that work of art, if they're going to be. And so we hopefully will be getting some results in soon, um, which will tell us um, ideally whether or not people are looking at art as an investment, whether they're looking, they're, they're looking at it um, in some way as just something to beautify their home, if they're Please looking... tell me it's not as an investment. Um, Please. Um, I would say that some people... Uh, Please well, tell me it's not to beautify their home. <laughs> you guys are really <laughs> weighing the scales here. Peter, <laughs> um, look. Support an emerging artist. Um, mm. And, you know, I mean, even though you guys might not like these possibilities, there's certainly ways that people participate in them. I mean, would you agree with that, or do you think that that's, that's an unfair characterization of the way that... I think art enhances your daily life, your daily way of thinking, your daily values, reasoning. That's it. That's what it is to me. And yet, I mean, to be fair, you guys are both commissioning, selling, <laughs> buying artworks yes. that are tens of millions of dollars. Um, you know, it's 20, okay, 50, 60 million dollars. I mean, you, well, you notably have sold, yeah, hundreds of, yeah, exactly. That's not simply just about of course beautifying not. an experience, or no. not beautifying, sorry, enhancing a daily life, excuse me. No, but it's, it's part of it all. Of course it's an investment after a certain level, but the goal is not the investment. Would you agree with that? I mean, of course it's not an investment, but exclusively. Um, I think buying art is spending money like buying clothes. You're spending money. And you buy what you like. Sometimes when you're shopping for clothes, you feel like something completely new. Other times you're feeling more conservative, depending on how you live. I mean, I don't <coughs> like the idea that you would ever buy art for financial reasons. I really think 
buying art is spending money like anything else and hopefully it enhances your life and that's why you're doing it. Mm. You're not looking for a return and, and art is something that you learn a lot from, like you, you learn about yourself. If I'll put, I put, by the way, I'm, I'm very peripatetic and I don't like things that don't move so I, I have a large bronze collection and I move them all the time. I particularly bring them into my bathroom because where else do you spend a lot of time and look at what is the last thing you do before you go to bed? You're in the bathroom. So if I put a Giacomo de Palma right there next to my sink, you know, I get a really good look at it. Just Som for, for context, people. you have one of the most notable Renaissance and later bronze collections in the world, just so that everyone knows the level that we're dealing with here. But so you bring these I, to your I'm bathroom. not joking, I put it next to my sink. Why? You wake up in the morning, it's the first thing you see, it's the last thing you see when you go to bed. You learn about it infinitely more than if you put it on the mantle in the living room. Who looks at the That's mantle? Brilliant. You know, so. <laughs> Never thought about that. Uh, news brilliant. you can use, folks. So I, a, now, you can't do that with a terribly expensive painting, but I do do with my bronzes, and I move them all around, and they have a life, and they, they interact with each other, and they interact with the drawings and paintings. And Honestly, uh, that, that is genuinely fascinating to hear. <laughs> um, uh, we're, we're, we're running out of time. I, I want to quickly look to 2019, and I would like to know from both of you guys if there's um, a spef specific thing. What is everyone going to be talking about in the art world in 2019? Peter, you start. <laughs> um, hopefully, they're talking about the bronze boxes that I make. I like I make a collection every two years, and if you Google Peter Marino bronze boxes, you'll see them. And I, because uh, I'm a complete bronze maniac, um, so I'm making these big bronze boxes takes like eight to ten guys to move them they weigh four tons but even i was told if there was an atomic bomb the bronze ba boxes would last so i'm just looking for permanence around here hope you'll see my collection when it comes out next year um, okay that's that's a and, and and dominique so bronze boxes peter's bronze atomic bomb blast proof proof, proof right bronze boxes I don't think I can compete with that. I'm <laughs> looking forward to that too. <laughs> um, tr truly, I, it's it's such a pleasure to hear both of your perspectives. Um, per and I know from an audience perspective, you know, hearing from people who are not only involved in the art world but actually pushing the art world forward and collecting for it and luxury for it. I mean, it's a real treat. Um, so. Dominique, thank you so much for being here. Peter, thank you so much for being here. And um, everyone, thank you so much for... for